everybody. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Very warm welcome tonight to Laidlaw College. Uh, a welcome to everyone who has joined us here physically and a very special welcome too to those who have uh, joined us via YouTube. How's that? Uh, my name is John De Jong. Uh, I am a lecturer here at Laidlaw College. Um, just some important logistics for the evening. In the case of an emergency, uh, we make our way in an orderly fashion through the door from which you came and out into the car park and assemble at the far side of the car park over there in the dark. Um, it is a very good time now to uh, silence your cell phone, please. Whare paku, or toilets, are out the door uh, through the atrium over that side. Uh, we're going to, after tonight's presentation, there will be a time for questions and answers from Chris. Um, for those who are in the room, I will be wandering around with the microphone. For those who are joining us via Zoom, uh, could you please post your questions on the U oh, not via Zoom via YouTube? Post your questions on the YouTube live chat, and so your questions will be asked on your behalf in that way. Um, it's my real pleasure now to um, introduce to you Professor Chris Marshall, and also a special welcome to Margaret Marshall, who uh, came up with him from Wellington. Uh, Chris completed a PhD through King's College London in the early 1980s. He was supervised by the late Professor Graham Stanton, who also happened to be a Kiwi. Immediately after completing his doctorate, Chris was called by God and David Stewart <laughs> to be the New Testament scholar and teacher at Laidlaw College, or Bible College of New Zealand as it was at that time. And he taught here from the mid-1980s to the mid-2000s. Although his PhD was completed in the context of classic British historical critical New Testament studies, Chris was never content with remaining in the past. Chris's uh, scholarship, in my reckoning, focused around four main foci, uh, Jesus, the kingdom of God, community, and mission. Uh, we could even understand those four under two rubrics, large areas. On the one hand, Jesus and the kingdom of God, and on the other hand, discipleship. It was a privilege of generations of Laidlaw students, myself included, others who are here tonight, uh, to be inspired by Chris's vision and his scholarship, to have our faith challenged and expanded and to receive a renewed understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In 2005, Chris moved to Victoria University as a religious studies lecturer and later became the inaugural holder of the Diana Unwin Chair in Restorative Justice at Victoria University. This was not a move away from Christian scholarship, but rather a further exploration and expression of what it means to follow Jesus and to seek first the kingdom of God and God's justice. So it's from this wealth of experience, scholarship and commitment that Chris will be sharing tonight on sin, shame and salvation, confronting and healing pathological shame. So let's welcome Chris. And let me pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this um, time we have tonight. We thank you for Chris and Margaret coming all the way from Wellington to be with us. And we thank you for what Chris has to share with us. And we commit him and pray for your uh, blessing and help for him as he presents tonight. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Well, kia ora tato. It's very nice to have so many people in this room and looking around at aged faces. I'm having a trouble at times time putting names to faces, but it's good to recognise you anyway. 
so thank you for coming on this very Wellington-like evening. Um, I feel at home, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure some of you don't. And thank you to Laidlaw College for inviting me to present tonight's lecture. Um, it's been almost 18 years since I left Laidlaw to move to Victoria University, and a lot has changed at the college since then. So it's been a real pleasure, genuine pleasure, to be around this week and to re-engage with old friends, with colleagues, and with former students. I do have many, many rich memories of the time and events from nearly two decades spent uh, teaching here, but also living on campus for much of that time and raising a young family here. So it really does feel a bit like coming home. Uh, those who may miraculously remember me from the time when I did teach here will know that I've long been motivated by concern to understand the role of justice and peacemaking in Christian discipleship, and particularly in how a more holistic or restorative rather than a narrowly retributive conception of justice can help us better appreciate the unfathomable mystery of the cross. But I've long known that there's been a kind of missing piece to the puzzle that would need more attention from me when I got the time. A recent invitation to contribute to a collection of essays on public theology and criminology gave me the opportunity to begin to grapple with this missing piece in more detail. And tonight I want to share just a little of what I've learned in the process, though I know I've only begun to scratch the surface of a very complex area. The issue I'm referring to is how Christ's redemptive work addresses the problem of entrenched shame in the human condition and its often debilitating impact on individuals. Now, that may sound like a relatively minor oversight on my part, but that's far from the case, as I think this illustration will show. In a notable essay published in 2003, forensic psychiatrist James Gilligan recounts what he had learned after working with thousands of violent offenders in prisons and mental health institutions for almost 40 years, what he had learned about the causes and prevention of violence, about what it is that drives certain people in certain circumstances to commit acts of extreme violence. Gilligan found that when he asked perpetrators about their crimes, they repeatedly offered him the same explanation. They said that they had used violence either because they had felt disrespected or dissed by their victims, or because they wanted to gain respect in the eyes of others. Their violence had served as a mechanism for countering feelings of belittlement or for achieving personal esteem. Gradually, Gilligan began to realize that it is the detrimental impact of shame on the psyche and the visceral need to ward off or eliminate shame that is the pathogen from which much violence springs, not only in interpersonal relationships, but even in large-scale intercommunal conflicts. Gilligan found, unsurprisingly, that most chronic offenders had almost always suffered overwhelming abuse or neglect in childhood. Many said that they felt dead inside, numb, empty, frozen, without human emotions such as love or fear or regret, and even unable to feel physical symptoms. It was as if their personalities had died, Gilligan said, long before they started killing others. The feeling of emotional or spiritual deadness was so intolerable that they were prepared to do anything, even commit horrific atrocities, including terrible self-mutilations, just in order to feel something again. Their violence was a desperate attempt, to quote him, to resurrect their dead self, and bring it back to life, to become born again, so to speak, through an act of apocalyptic violence. At first, Gilligan thought that he had discovered something original about the genesis of violence, something previously unknown. 
But then he happened to be rereading the story of Cain and Abel. And he realized that, in his words, the Bible had arrived at the same psychological insight that I had, but a long time earlier. <laughs> the reason Cain killed his brother Abel was because Cain felt diminished by Abel's fortunes, and he lashed out at him in anger. Similar accounts of shame-induced violence recur in the great myths of the classical tradition as well. And the phenomenon has also been recognized by a great many philosophers and thinkers of the West, as well as by a growing number of behavioral scientists today. Shame begets violence, while violence engenders further shame in a self-perpetuating cycle of ruin. That being the case, any attempt to prevent or mitigate interpersonal violence must surely then attend to the root cause of violence, the destructive impact of internalized shame. But this presents a peculiar challenge for the criminal justice system, which we task with the job of redressing violence uh, on behalf of the community. The challenge is at least twofold. The first is that while criminal penalties are apportioned on the basis of proven guilt and are intended, at least rhetorically, to elicit remorse and amendment in the offender, those who commit violent crime in the grip of shame, in the deadly grip of shame, frequently lack any remorse or guilt for their actions. Guilt requires some degree of empathetic imagination, but pathological shame inhibits or contails the operation of empathy. It drowns out the voice of conscience and accountability to others while amplifying the, the uh, perpetrator's own internal anguish and sense of grievance. The second challenge is even more serious for our criminal justice system. The imposition of punishment on habitually violent offenders does nothing to remedy the root cause of their behavior, the shameful root of their conduct. In fact, punishment could even be the most powerful stimulant of violence yet discovered. Decades of psychological research has shown that imposing punitive shame on such wrongdoers, far from encouraging them to amend their ways, often triggers a deluge of defiant responses, including anger, bitterness, denial, self-justification, and aggression. Arguably, in fact, inarguably, I'm never quite sure what the difference between arguably and inarguably is, but <laughs> arguably, it is a failure to recognize this or attempt to repair the ruinous impact of pathological shame on those caught up in serious crime that is the Achilles heel of much criminal justice policy and practice. Rather than mitigating shame, if anything, our current system exacerbates the problem. But failure to attend to the problem of shame is also a yawning gap and a good deal of theological reflection on sin, repentance, and atonement, which historically has done much to shape uh, approaches to crime and punishment in the West. Both criminological and theological reflection have been dominated by the language of guilt and punishment. Both have largely failed to factor in the role of shame in understanding and responding to human transgression, and both often display an impoverished understanding of what is involved in defeating its ongoing thrall in the lives of individuals. So what I want to do and what follows is propose that the unique saving power ascribed to the life, death and resurrection of Christ in the New Testament, known in theological shorthand as the atonement, includes its capacity to expose, absorb and disrupt the tyranny of shame and to offer a path to healing for those enmeshed in its tangled web. I think recognizing this truth is perhaps particularly important in our current situation, where spewing of hatred and the public shaming of others through social media 
in which I do not indulge. I don't have social media, so I'm only going by what I hear. But the spewing of hatred and public shaming is causing untold harm to the mental well-being of millions and is stoking violence towards stigmatized communities. And it's a real problem. But before we get on to what am I talking about, what do we actually mean by shame? What kind of experience does the word shame refer to? Why does it occur? And what does it mean when it does occur? Now, answering those questions is, as I quickly found out, complicated. <laughs> very, very complicated. And I don't pretend at all to have mastered this area. I just want to offer some introductory observations. Let me just wet my whistle before I get going. In general terms, the word shame is usually used to describe the feeling of emotional and physiological distress that comes from an awareness that one has somehow failed to, love up, to live up to the expectations or the standards of oneself or that are held by others uh, towards our behavior. The feeling of emotional and physiological distress the, the physiological reactions like you know, the lowering of the eyes, the blushing of the skin, the slumping of the shoulders, which have been shown to be almost universal human uh, physiological uh, expressions of, sh of shame. Uh, a sense of distress that comes from the awareness that one has somehow failed to live up to the standards one expects of oneself or by others. The feeling can vary in intensity and duration from mild self-reproach to extreme self-disgust. Though the term usually implies more than a kind of fleeting embarrassment or a passing disappointment. Instead, when we use the word, we are usually referring to a pronounced sense of personal diminishment, a, a devastating feeling of failure that strikes at the core of one's identity and self-esteem and gives rise to the fear that if other people know about it, they will reject us. And as social animals, we will go to any lengths imaginable to avoid the sense of rejection. Now, beyond that high-level generalisation, there is considerable debate of how the phenomenon of shame should be understood, defined, theorised and addressed. The term is used differently in different academic and clinical discourses. And there are so many diverse ways that shame functions, both individually and collectively, that it's almost impossible to arrive at an agreed definition that covers all of them. The conditions that give rise to shame also vary markedly across historical epochs and cultural settings. Declarations in 1 Corinthians, for example, that it is shameful for a man to wear long hair or for women to speak in public assemblies were evidently meaningful in the first century context, but they make little sense in most modern settings. There are also some peculiar features about shame itself that make it elusive to pin down. One such feature is the way that shame is intrinsically connected with concealment. That is to say, the experience of shame typically drives people to want to hide their faces so as to avoid the discomfort that may come from being exposed to critical gaze and found wanting. This prospect of being exposed and found wanting is so threatening that evasion or denial or even self-destruction can seem like a better option. Suicide, for example, has been described as, quote, the most extreme maladaptive hiding response of shame. The most extreme attempt to hide from shame is to take your own life. This drive to escape unwanted exposure is depicted in the archetypal story of the emergence of shame in the Garden of Eden. Initially, Adam and Eve, we're told, felt no shame in their nakedness, not because they were shameless in the sense that they lacked any respect for appropriate boundaries, but because they enjoyed perfect trust with each other and with God. 
But when they breached the divinely imposed boundary on their behavior through an act of disobedience, their instinctive response, the narrative said, was, quote, to hide themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. When God searches out the fugitives, Adam replies, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. It was not only their shameful deed they sought to conceal, it was their shameful state, which led them to flee from connection with God and project responsibility for their failure onto others. Shame, it seems, has an incurable tendency to hide its own existence, to disrupt relational intimacy, and to displace responsibility for its presence elsewhere. One of, the, one of the main ways it does this psychologically is by secreting itself with an other emotional and physiological reactions like fear or anxiety or guilt or anger, jealousy, depression, violence, addictive behaviors, and a wide range of other pathological uh, behaviors. As a result, the shame often goes unrecognized, unnamed, and unaddressed as it directs attention away from itself and onto other presenting symptoms. And this also influences, therefore, the way shame is conceptualized by researchers or therapists, because it's not always agreed, they, uh, they do not always agree on its presence or its primacy within broader patterns of harmful behavior. For some, it may just be a minor symptom of something else. For others, it is a subterranean furnace for many of the troubles that afflict us and that gets confused by putting other labels on it because shame is sort of hiding behind the rocks. So shame comes in many guises. It has both external and internal dimensions, both public and personal applications, both positive and negative functions. And there's no time to try and delineate the many faces of shame uh, tonight. We'll require a very long lecture, in fact, a very long book, and it would certainly exceed my expertise. But there are two distinctions worth making for our purposes before we turn to the gospel story. Uh, the conceptual distinctions, I think reality is always much more blurry than our, our analytical mind wants to, uh, certainly I would like to carve things up into clear categories. And so these two things are not as easily distinguished perhaps in practice, but I think the, 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 the conceptual distinctions are important. And the two I'm talking about is the difference between acute shame and chronic shame, on the one hand, and the distinction between shame and guilt, on the other. Acute shame refers to the intense discomfort that comes from doing something that breaches the accepted rules that govern interpersonal behavior, or from experiencing something that something that erodes one's sense of dignity and autonomy. Now, we might just, for argument's sake, call this a kind of moral shame. In most cases, this shame response is reasonably sharp and short-lived. The sinking feeling of dejection that we feel when we are aware that somehow we've done something that we ought not to have done, or something's been done to us that has somehow um, eroded our sense of dignity and autonomy, that sinking feeling is usually remedied by making behavioral changes that will restore our sense of, our sense of self-respect and sustain our relational belonging. So this, if you like, is a positive or healthy function of shame. A God-given capacity to feel shame is one of the most critical defenses we have against acting on impulses or desires that might be destructive of our dignity or dangerous to others. And for this reason, a shameless person, I'm tempted to refer to a very famous shameless person who's recently changed his job, but for this reason, a shameless person <laughs> is considered such an object of scorn because they fail to feel the appropriate shame that they ought to feel. The, the shame that holds them accountable to the moral values and ideals on which society depends. But there is a world of difference between acute episodes of healthy shame, if you like, which 
although painful and not detrimental to personal well-being, and the experience of chronic or persistent shame, which has an altogether more deleterious impact. Chronic shame emerges when our ability to absorb or process normal shame is overwhelmed by its intensity or its frequency so that temporary feelings of failure or unworthiness or rejection become a permanent state of being, a habitat in which the self is formed and operates. Everybody experiences shame periodically, but the chronically shamed person takes a lifelong leasehold on shame. Often chronic shame is a product of childhood neglect or trauma. But as Stephen Patterson notes, he wrote a very large book on, on shame, very depressing book. Um, um, as he notes, any life experiences that induce a persistent sense of inferiority or worthlessness, abandonment, weakness, unwantedness, violation, defilement, stigmatization, unlovability, exclusion, any life experiences that produce a persistent sense of those sorts of uh, symptoms are likely to be generative of chronic shame. He likens such shame to a kind of internalized pollution. The shame bearer feels permanently defiled, dirty, stained, spoiled, a nobody, somebody who is utterly unworthy of love. This feeling is so unbearable for people <coughs> that individuals develop a range of mechanisms for averting it. Donald Nathan probably can't read that, but his, um, his celebrated Compass of Shame identifies four common strategies that people use to try and deal with this experience of persistent toxic shame. One is to withdraw from context where that kind of shame is going to be uh, likely to occur or to, or to reveal itself. Another is to avoid the problem through denial or deception or self-aggrandizement or through compulsive behaviors. Another is to attack the self through self-harming or self-mortification or self-deprecation. Or on the other side, to attack others, to project the shame, fueled by rage and contempt onto others through verbal and physical violence. Often the target of such attacks has qualities that remind the person about themselves, the thing they most despise about themselves, and they lash out because they're, in a sense, kind of attacking themselves or attacking the person who embodies it before them. So chronic or toxic shame has been called a silent killer, a terrible lifelong affliction, and an ever-present danger lurking in the wings. Yet, its presence often goes unnoticed as it burrows deep into the psyche and morphs into a range of damaging behaviours that serve to mask its existence while spreading its toxicity. So there is an important distinction between healthy and unhealthy shame, between acute shame and toxic shame. There's also a valuable distinction between shame and guilt. So, <clears throat> this is an interesting one. Teasing out the connection between shame and guilt is by no means easy. Um, the terms are often used interchangeably in everyday speech and indeed by, uh, by scholars and clinicians as well. And the terms are used almost sometimes synonymously because they share many common features. Uh, both shame and guilt, for example, are forms of neg negative self-assessment. Uh, both are social emotions intended to guide interpersonal relationships. And both arise from a fear, from a failure to conform to internal or, or, or external standards. Furthermore, both responses can be induced by the same episode and exist simultaneously. When somebody transgresses a moral rule, for example, they can end up feeling both guilty about their actions 
and ashamed of themselves for giving way to temptation. Similarly, a person who feels ashamed of some unchosen feature of their identity, such as their appearance or their temperament or their sexual orientation or their social origin, things that they didn't choose for themselves but causes them to feel ashamed, can also feel guilty about continually struggling with the things that they cannot change and that they think ought not to bother them anyway. So the two concepts clearly overlap in several ways. And in fact, it's the, it's the way in which the two feed each other, which I think becomes a real challenge for, for, um, for salvation or redemption or, or whatever, atonement, if you like. But having pointed to those commonalities, it is, I think, still important not simply to conflate the two and to treat them as synonymous because they also differ from each other in a whole variety of ways. For example, the capacity for shame in children precedes the development of the cognitive capacity for guilt. Shame is now thought to be first activated uh, in the human person by momentary disruptions in an infant's attachment bonds with its caregivers because shame is about moderating relationships. And the most important relationship we ever have in life is with our first caregiver. And if that gets disrupted, not through necessary abusive behavior, but even by not turning up when you're hungry or need your nappy change, that can produce this sense of threat to your well-being. And uh, people, uh, scholars now identify this as a kind of, if you like, the, the seedbed of the capacity to feel shame. Whereas guilt involves the ability to reason about right and wrong and is associated with a gradual acquisition of language. So guilt is not derivative of shame or vice versa. They seem to sort of have independent points of origin in our development. Guilt and shame also have a different focus of concern. Guilt involves negative judgment about one's actions or conduct. I did something wrong and I feel guilty about it. While shame involves negative assessments about oneself. I am a bad person. The guilt-sensitive person attributes their bad behaviour to poor decision-making or external circumstances, whereas the shame person attributes it to some defect in their personality, proof positive that I'm not right. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. Guilt and shame also affect relationships differently. In many ways, guilt is a pro-social emotion. Its focus on wrongful actions encourages the guilty party to recognize the harmful impact of their behavior on others and to take steps to put things right. Guilt encourages empathy, remorse, responsibility taking, and reparation, and thus has the potential to strengthen social relationships and foster ethical commitment. Shame, however, motivates a turning inwards and a turning away from others. It inhibits empathetic engagement because the locus of pain is in the wounded self, not in the injured party. All my emotional energy goes into managing my pain rather than beginning to enter into the interior life of a person that I may have hurt. But for our purposes, most importantly, I'm going to argue anyway, Remedying the legacy of shame is far more complex than it is for guilt. The ability to, to acknowledge one's guilt, express remorse, offer restitution and seek pardon means that the burden of guilt can be discharged, self-respect restored and relationships renewed. The magic oil to do that is confession, repentance, correction and pardon and they can help stem the flow of guilt, the negative flow of guilt in our experience. But those sorts of magic oils, if you like, have limited impact on ingrained shame because they reinforce the tendency of the shame bearer to view themselves as ontologically flawed, as incapable of change, unworthy of respect and undeserving of love. Guilt then, I'm going to suggest, is a simpler, and more productive problem to deal with than shame. Whereas guilt can be pardoned and its damage to others repaired, 
shame's presence must be exposed, its corruption cleansed, its power thwarted, and its wounds staunched if lasting change is to occur. And that's obviously a much more difficult task. So in what ways then does the Christian story speak to this more complex and tenacious legacy? We're all familiar with a framing of the gospel that speaks to the qualms of the guilty. We do it all the time. But how can it be framed in a way that speaks to the loneliness and the sadness and the despair of the chronically shamed? A core Christian conviction is, in the words of 1 Timothy 1.15, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This salvation was accomplished both through Christ's distinctive way of being human in the world, as one who lived in perfect conformity with God's intentions for humanity as a kind of second Adam, and through his representative death and resurrection, which served, in the words of Hebrews, as a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. By sacrifice of atonement here is meant a purposeful act that enabled the restoration of humanity's ruptured relationship with God by eradicating the blight of sin that has marred that relationship. Whereas atoning sacrifices were a regular feature in the life of biblical Israel, the distinctive contention of Christian faith is that Christ's self-sacrifice was once and for all a unique and universally effective remedy for sin never to be repeated again. The Christian doctrine of the atonement seeks to understand and explain that astonishing claim. The New Testament itself, as far as I can uh, work out, offers no developed theory of atonement that explains how and why Christ's death and resurrection were decisive in overcoming sin. Instead, it provides a cluster of metaphors, of images, and of analogies drawn from across the range of human experience that seek to communicate the experiential impact of what has happened. Some of these images and metaphors were subsequently fashioned into overarching theories of atonement. Each theory contains important insights, but none has been universally endorsed by the church or incorporated into its creeds, simply because no one explanation has proven adequate to the task of comprehending the inexhaustible mystery that is involved. In most theological explanations, I've already hinted at this, sorry, I have to keep, um, <clears throat> sorry, I've got to really look after my voice these days, so. In most theological interpretations, uh, the dominant categories used to explain the mechanics of atonement are those of law, sin, guilt, punishment, and forgiveness. Those are kind of the vocabulary that's most often used. And we're all familiar with this, I'm sure, just from our Christian experience. Sin is construed as a moral transgression against God's law, giving rise to the debt of guilt that requires discharging for justice to be satisfied and forgiveness to occur, with Christ's death providing the necessary means of sort of punitive recompense in the uh, transaction. Now, the predominance of these categories, I think, is entirely appropriate, given that the necessity of atonement stems directly from the need to address humanity's proneness to wrongdoing and its relational consequences. So, in a sense, there's nothing wrong with that kind of vocabulary because it helps us get to the fact that we're dealing with uh, issues of moral import. But I think difficulties arise when we use these categories too rigidly, or define them too narrowly, or explain them transactionally rather than relationally. For when sin is restricted to acts of moral transgression, and personal guilt is construed as the critical problem that needs to be resolved, the net effect is to obscure the pivotal role of shame 
in the saving drama. Shame is eclipsed by a narrow focus on legal guilt and judgment. And the work of atonement apparently has little bearing on the problem of shame and the existence of shame. One theologian wrote 20 years ago, I know of no approach to the atonement that seeks to frame the doctrine as a response to human shame. I, I think that's perhaps too sweeping a judgment because there have been attempts by some missionary theologians in particular to depict the work of salvation in terms of the displacement of collective shame with divine honour because forensic models of atonement often have little traction in shame-based cultures. So people have tried to use categories of honour and shame uh, in non-Western settings. But the challenge before us, I think, is greater than providing a kind of contextual repackaging of the gospel for non-Western audiences. There is also a need to explain the, how the existential bondage of shame has been ruptured through Christ's saving work so that sinners are empowered in Paul's words to walk in newness of life, freed from the things of which you are now ashamed. To my mind, two things are required, at least two things, as far as my thinking has gone, at least two things are required for this undertaking. One is a more profound, I was going to say richer, but it's not quite the right um, metaphor when you're talking about sin, a more profound and relational understanding of sin. The conception of sin in the Bible is much greater than the problem of moral guilt. If guilt alone were the obstacle to salvation, then surely confession, repentance, restitution and forgiveness would be enough to do the job. But sin is more than guilt. Sin is an irresistible bias in the human heart toward evil, a poison that permeates the entire life system of the race, a corruption that clings like dirt and a controlling power that holds humanity in its deadly grip no matter what it does to shake itself free. The problem that needs to be addressed for salvation then is sin's deadly combination of guilt, shame, and servitude. The atonement rituals in Israel recognize this complexity, and Paul articulates it theologically most profoundly. But so often we relapse into very simplified ways of construing the problem of sin and its solution. We need a more comprehensive, a richer doctrine of sin uh, if you say a more serious doctrine of sin, that has a whole baggage for it as well, but a more comprehensive doctrine of sin uh, if we're going to begin to think about how shame is addressed through the redemption. The other thing we need is a way of reading the story of Jesus that accentuates the story of his life, death, and resurrection that accentuates his definitive confrontation with shame in all its forms. And in the remaining minutes, I want to just sketch one way of beginning to do this. <clears throat> Jesus was born into an ancient Mediterranean society in which honour and shame were pivotal public values that structured the daily lives of everybody, both elites and non-elites, both in the public arena and in the private sphere as well. Honour and shame were key public values recognised throughout the ancient uh, Mediterranean world. To possess honour in such a hierarchical setting meant having the means to display one's prestige and power and status, things that were derived from genealogical origins or social roles or personal achievements to display it, and all the cultural cues were there, to display one's esteem and status and to have it acknowledged openly by others. Honour was thought to be a strictly limited commodity and competition for it was intense and often brutal. Any lowering of one's standing in relation to others brought shame and the determination to avoid such shame 
and to uphold or burnish one's honour drove social relationships at every level and fueled perpetual antagonism, conflict and oppression. Now, when the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and teaching are viewed against this cultural backdrop, three things stand out very strongly and very quickly. The first is that Jesus identified himself with and directed his redemptive activity towards the greatest objects of shame in his society, those on the margins of the community, such as the poor, the sick, the hungry, the demon-possessed, the ritually impure, outcasts, prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners. It was those who bore the full brunt of social stigma and isolation that best represented the corrupting impact of shame on human existence and human society. And it was to them, Jesus announced, the year of the Lord's favour. Secondly, in his teaching, Jesus and his practice, Jesus redefined conventional standards of honour and shame and reversed current valuations of greatness and inferiority. What society deemed to be the last, the least and the lost, Jesus esteemed as the first, the greatest and the foremost. All who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. In the Sermon on the Mount, for example, Jesus rejects accepted links between honour and social dominance and confers God's blessing on those whose behaviour and status were culturally a source of contempt. The destitute, the meek, the hungry, the peacemakers and the persecuted. Instead of engaging in public competition for human recognition, he instructs his followers to withdraw entirely from the great game of reputation, as one commentator puts it, and to focus their, intention, their attention in private on the true basis of human value, the approval of God and the imitation of his gracious goodness towards all. Here then, Jesus disrupts shame in two ways. He rejects social definitions of shame that oppress the weak and the vulnerable, and he recalibrates the shame dial, the healthy shame dial, uh, away from what other people think about you, back to true north, which is what the Heavenly Father sees uh, in secret uh, about you. The third thing to emerge is Jesus' willing acceptance of the most shameful form of death imaginable in the ancient world, death by crucifixion. As a troublesome prophet, Jesus clearly expected to die at the hands of the ruling authorities, and he did nothing to avoid or deliver himself from this terrible fate, despite the sheer terror it evoked. By embracing the cross willingly, he confronted shame in its most diabolical form. When the author of Hebrews speaks of Christ enduring the cross and despising its shame, he is not merely reflecting on the contemporary valuation of crucifixion as irredeemably shameful. He is also perhaps alluding to how he overcame, overcame the deadly grip of shame itself. There is an essential relationship, in other words, between the manner of Jesus' death and its meaning. By dying in shame on a cross, he also died to shame once and for all so that others might live free, a lift for God free from its dominion. So let me just say a little bit more about each side of that equation. I'm sorry about this, <laughs> this watering. <clears throat> so we've just been through Easter. And um, I hope this begins to explain you know, some of the, the horror, I guess, that we have been recounting over the Easter period. Death by crucifixion was uniformly regarded in antiquity as the ghastliest penalty anyone could suffer. Descriptions of the practice are rare in ancient documents, 
presumably because the literary elite found the subject too distasteful to dwell on. But all who do mention it agree that it was the most cruel and disgusting penalty, in Cicero's words, the most wretched of deaths, in the words of Josephus, an utter disgrace, and a disgraceful punishment even for worthless men. The revulsion felt towards crucifixion was not because of the physical suffering it involved. I guess, theoretically, there'd be more painful ways to die because people can imagine ways of sustaining people in suffering for even longer periods of time. The revulsion wasn't because it was a physically painful way to die, although obviously it was. The revulsion was, was because of the immeasurable public shame it conveyed. All the gruesome twists of the spectacle were intended to con communicate the complete and utter degradation of the victim to the very limits of the cultural imagination. The degradation began by being condemned to die in a way that was reserved for the dregs of society, those entirely lacking in honour, criminals, rebels, traitors, pirates, foreigners, prisoners of war, and especially offending slaves who could be executed on a whim. The physical torture and mutilation involved, which often includes scourging, blinding with hot irons, amputation of body parts, breaking on a rack, sexual violation, and impaling with spikes. All those bodily mutilations were a conscious assault on the bodily grammar of honour and shame by making the victim look ugly and repulsive. The nakedness of the victim was also a humiliation because it signalled a total loss of power and dignity. This impotence was sometimes reinforced by having the prisoner's family butchered before his eyes as a way of blotting out his entire existence, a kind of genocide reduced to one. In a Jewish setting, the shame of involuntary nakedness was particularly acute because it was scandalous to see male genitalia, frequently denoted by the euphemism shame, exposed to view. The disgrace was comp compounded by the bodily defecation and the swarming of flies that accompanied death, and by being left on the cross to, uh, for days to be devoured by wild animals and birds of prey, or being chucked into a common grave rather than being afforded what was considered the most important thing in the, in the world, a proper burial. Such was the ignominy entailed that many Jews interpreted crucifixion ipso facto, as a sign that the victim had even been cursed by God himself, the ultimate confirmation of shame. Those who witnessed crucifixion clearly recognised the deliberate shaming of the victim. Even if they pitied the victim's agony, they accepted the official propaganda that crucifixion was a means of protecting the populace from dangerous criminals and violent men, and they heaped contempt on those who suffered it. Jesus was required to carry his cross to the place of execution in a public walk of shame that involved taunting and ridicule right up until he drew his last breath. The abuse focused particularly on his shameful powerlessness. He who saved others, himself he cannot save. As well as being the object of shame, the accounts indicate that Jesus experienced the subjective desolation of shame as well. His heart-wrenching cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is a quotation from Psalm 22, a prayer of lament of those suffering scorn and shame at the hands of their enemies. How, however we explain the meaning of these words, Jesus clearly ut felt utterly bereft of God's presence and love as the accumulated sin and shame of all time was somehow focused on him at this point, and he plumbed the depths of isolation from God and subjection to evil. One commentator suggests that the cry of dereliction shows, it's on the screen, that shame had penetrated to the very core of Jesus' being, causing him to lose access to God's heart 
and then to suffer heartbrokenness. In dying in shame, Jesus also died to the power of shame and sin once and for all. As Israel's Messiah and divinely appointed representative of the human race, what he achieved personally redounded to the benefit of us all. Just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. But how was shame in particular undone by Christ's saving work? In what ways did his representative death serve to disparage the destructive power of shame in the human condition? I don't know <laughs> uh, fully. But I think most fundamentally it did this by bestowing absolute value on every human life. Christ's chosen solidarity with humanity in its most shamed state and suffering the most shameful penalty that humanity could devise, his solidarity with humanity in this state represents the ultimate validation of the inviolable dignity and worth of every human person, irrespective of anything they have done or any indignity they have suffered. At the heart of toxic shame, we've seen, is a sense of being flawed, sullied, diminished at the core of one's being, and a consequent fear that others, if only they knew, would reject us as being undeserving of love and acceptance. The cross proves that this diagnosis is false. It proves that every individual, irrespective of their actions or achievements or any debasement they have endured at the hands of others, has indestructible worth and deserves to be loved at all costs. Paul speaks very movingly of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Shame theorists and clinicians often identify the experience of empathy as the quality that most counteracts entrenched shame and helps its sufferers to overcome the isolation and alienation that shame brings. Empathy is the capacity to understand and share in the feelings of others based on our common humanity. To show empathy for someone is to affirm their significance and to help them recognize that their darkest fears and struggles are not unique to them alone, an abomination that dares not speak its name, but are actually part of a universally shared human anguish. In this way, as one writer puts it, empathy is an adjudication of a person's inherent value. This is exactly what we see enacted in the cross. A display, a display of divine empathy for human destitution that adjudicates on the absolute value of, it, of its recipients and proves their intrinsic lovability. Of course, grace is a much richer concept than empathy for describing this experience. Grace denotes a categorical acceptance of someone's worth, not on the grounds of their achievements or social identity, or conformity to some external standard of acceptability, but solely on the basis of their intrinsic value as a human being. We often define grace loosely as unmerited favor, but it is unmerited not in the sense of being entirely unwarranted, but in the sense of being warranted solely on the basis of one's unique creaturehood irrespective of any other merits or qualities or deserts a person possesses. So just let that sink in for a bit, because I think, I, you know, I, I think that's quite an important, for me it's been quite an important uh, insight to, to, to recognise that. That you know, often grace is spoken of as God pinching his nose, he can't 
stand the odour of being Nero's, but nonetheless uh, choosing to, to do nice things for us. But I think grace is a, is a much more affirmative uh, reality than that. Paradoxically, you could even say that grace proves our worthwhileness rather than our worthlessness. That Christ loved humanity enough to endure and exhaust its shame in order to bring us into union with God confers absolute value on humanity. And when someone personally recognises that they are unconditionally loved and accepted and honoured by the source of all goodness and beauty in the universe, when they recognise that, they have the deepest remedy for shame imaginable. At the same time, Christ's death removes the shame that stems from moral and relational failure, a shame that attaches both to the wrongdoer and often to those who have been wronged. The sacrificial system in Israel sought to deal with such shame by ritually drawing it to the surface of consciousness and bringing it into contact with a source of purity and holiness greater than the shame itself. The pollution of sin was absorbed by the purity of the sacrificial victim and washed away by the shedding of its life-giving blood. But the writer to Hebrews, of Hebrews argues that the constant repetition of this process only showed that the inner power of shame has still not finally been dislodged. Otherwise, he writes, Hebrews 10, would not sacrifices have ceased being offered since the worshippers cleansed once for all would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. As the incarnate Son of God, Christ absorbed the defilement of human shame and put it to death once and for all. As some unfathomable, unfathomable metaphysical level, his sinless humanity was fused with the sinful condition of the human race and he soaked up the infection of shame like a poultice and took it to the grave. The power of shame to diminish human worth and dictate human behaviour is ended definitively in Christ's death to sin and shame. Those who participate in his victory through the gift of the Holy Spirit embark on a lifelong journey of restoration in which radical self-acceptance as someone uniquely loved and treasured by God, irrespective of anything they have done or anything they have suffered. And often toxic shame is due to suffering offences rather than committing offences. Radical self-acceptance, irrespective of anything done or anything suffered, is accompanied by commitment to moral transformation and a growing conformity to the image and freedom of Jesus Christ. The saying is sure and worthy of acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. The salvation Christ accomplished I've argued included a remedy for pathological shame as well as for personal guilt and moral servitude. To address shame, he identified himself with the most dishonoured groups in society. He embraced the most shameful of deaths conceivable and he entered into the greatest desolations imaginable, yet without surrendering his trust in God. By enduring the cross and despising its shame, he broke the grip of shame and opened up a participation in his restored humanity to all who embraced it in faith and are infused with the spirit. Shame is not eliminated in this process of renewal because our capacity for shame remains an essential attribute of being human as something that alerts us to our relational responsibilities and helps protect our sense of dignity. But as pathological features can be progressively healed or repaired so that shame no longer inhibits personal flourishing or distorts healthy relationships. For what greater affirmation of one's value can there be 
than to be personally loved by the Son of God, to, to be the reason for his self-sacrifice, and to participate in his risen life through the Holy Spirit, and to, uh, to participate in the healing and restoring power of his Spirit. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto kato. Chris, for that, um, well, what should I say, vintage Chris Marshall <laughs> presentation. Uh, profound, um, wide ranging, and very um, inspiring and convicting. So, uh, you must be tired after that, but you've got to ask some I'm questions now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a kind of talk, I think, that'll, um, yeah, it will take for us has, who heard it some time to process and think about and think about over the coming days and weeks but uh, now there may be some questions uh, well there's one right there okay I'll bring the microphone over thanks very much that was brilliant um, I, I heard um, a fantastic um, amount of uh, awesome information about how much Jesus loves us and how much he has done for us. Um, how do you understand God the Father working in atonement? Uh, because uh, it, when it comes to Psalm 22 and the Father turned his face away, it sounds, um, well, as Stuart Townsend says, um, it, it fits very well with um, a more guilt-based uh, atonement theory and penal substitution. Um, but how do you understand God the Father working uh, to um, sort out sort out shame in the cross. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to begin to even answer that. I mean, I'm not a Trinitarian theologian who can sort of speak um, very profoundly about these issues. I mean. Uh, I don't think we set God the Father and God the Son in opposition to each other with God the Son doing something to keep God the Father happy, um, which sometimes, in its worst, has been the way atonement has been spoken of. Um, God the Son is God the Father incarnate in human experience, and he, he has entered into the most um, abominable state that human beings have have ever been in, in order to show that there's something greater than that sense of lostness and shame. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to sort of navigate my, own, my way around the question. Um, perhaps somebody who's more theologically astute than me can, can do that. Um, Well, that's right. I mean, I think that the, I, mean, <laughs> I used to say to students in religious studies classes, most of whom weren't Christian, uh, on the prodigal son story, just imagine if God was actually like that. <laughs> just you know, start with that assumption that the way that Jesus is, is, is displaying this, uh, this paternal prodigality of grace is actually what God is like. Um, I think many Christians don't really believe that. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, in your work in restorative justice and in your own sort of reflections, which communities do you encounter who struggle most to wrestle with the concept of shame or to, to respond to it in some way as part of that process? I mean, what my sense is that, is that shame is a major social problem. Um, anthropologists used to distinguish between guilt-based cultures and shame-based cultures. And I guess there are some differences, and those who have worked in uh, non-Western societies would be able to speak uh, more uh, accurately than, than I can. But I think the distinction between guilt-based and shame-based cultures is a kind of oversimplification. And in fact, when you start thinking about it, we are also a shame-based culture. And just think of social media. Uh, just think of the way that people are so inclined to stigmatise and to, and to, and to exclude. Um, so I'm not sure there's any particular communities that most struggle. I think we all struggle with it. 
um, but we often don't understand what we're struggling with. Um, so, so I, yeah, yeah, I just, I mean, I just, when you start to sort of be alert to these issues, you see it everywhere. But I guess that's always the case when you when you start focusing on something. Thanks again, Chris. One image that I keep thinking about is the woman at the well and how Jesus unpacked who she was and her life story in effect and the shame that underlied a lot of who she was. And in that story we see the redemptive work that brings a freedom to someone who was literally trying to keep away from the crowds and keep away from her peers and be at the well at the mm. hottest part of the day. Does, yeah. does that, to you, provide an image of perhaps what that work is about? Yep. <laughs> now you've drawn my attention to it, for sure. I mean, in the restorative justice world, we speak a lot about um, inclusion. We have a process that tries to be as inclusive as possible. I know the word inclusion gets a bit of a um, uh, overworking in Christian circles, but I, you know, I do really think that that the inclusiveness of the gospel is really fundamental to what's going on. You know, it, it's it's about a, a, a work of God that is intended to include everybody. Um, sometimes we package it in more exclusionary ways. You know, join this team. If you don't, then you're you know you're you you don't get the benefits. Um, and I you know, I was asked to speak. I know I don't want to get into this question because I'll never get. <laughs> invited back, but I was asked to uh, go over to Australia and participate in a conference on evangelical universalism. And um, because that's actually a growing, it's a growing uh, conversation in the evangelical world. And um, I said, you know, I, I, I'm not sh quite sure that I would use the term universalist, although, you know, I'm actually not too bothered by it, but I said I, I'm a kind of optimistic inclusivist. <laughs> You know, I think, I think everything we know about God in the life of Jesus, everything we know about him, is an attempt to include those who are being excluded. It's constantly bringing people in who have been driven out. And doing that is to overcome the social shame that is, it was used to keep them out. And I think, you know, as we present the gospel, it ought to have that, you know, that, that sense that yeah, everybody's included. You know, this is for everybody. Um, there is nobody who is beyond the love of God. That the thing that God values most is our unique creaturehood. Uh, everything else is, is secondary. So you know, again, this is about shame and and and, um, and healing as well. But fundamentally, I think it's it's about overcoming the isolation that we impose on people by excluding. Kia ora, Chris. Thank you so much. I've got a question from our live stream. Um, so this is from Anglican Padre online, and they're wondering, I'm a worker within the Department of Corrections on the front line with persons who, in my view, are suffering the consequences of entrenched shame. How can we begin to shift the retributive paradigm toward a restorative one in which we begin to heal that shame? I wish I knew. <laughs> It's certainly true. I think the modern prison system is the most shame-laden institution that we've ever come up with. Um, and the people who, who are caught up in that system bear a lifetime legacy of shame. And as I said at the beginning of the, of the lecture, so often the behaviour that they're in there for, wrong as it is, has been fed by this, you know, this, this wounded self that has been shamed. Um, so, certainly, this, the, the, the sort of the, the correction system is you know, primary territory for talking about these sorts of issues. How do we shift the paradigm? <laughs> um, two ways. One is by living an alternative story as a community, um, by, by practicing a different way of doing justice. Uh, as insignificant as it appears on the larger scale. And that's really important, I think, that there is a kind of grassroots drive for a different way of dealing with these problems. 
Um, but ultimately, the paradigm won't shift until it's shifted politically and, and, and uh, in terms of policy. And that's a very tall order. And um, you know, I, there's no simple answers to that. Um, um, there, are, there are attempts to try and shift the paradigm, but because I, I don't think the fundamental problem with the existing paradigm is actually being faced, that often is just tinkering around the edges, and that's, I think, is going to be the norm. But eventually, you know, I, 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 maybe if we were sort of three or hundred years ago, we'd be talking about slavery in these terms, saying how on earth are we going to deal with this terrible social problem of slavery? Uh, ultimately, it's by a grassroots community following a different story, uh, giving a lie to the lies that the system is based on, uh, and, and, and putting pressure for change at that level, but until changes happen at a political level, then we'll still have the damage being done to people. We've got uh, four more questions lined up, and that'll probably take four us more? through to four more. Is that all right? Oh. Yep. <laughs> and that'll probably take us through to um, refreshment time. Kia ora, Chris. Uh, Peter speaking. Um, my question is pretty similar to the previous one. Um, because I was thinking about those first two people you were mentioning at the beginning, our, our prisoners that are in, uh, incarcerated, suffering with that shame. I'm aware that Corrections is starting to try and do empathy training for their correction officers. Do you think that that is the only really way, way forward, or is there a dramatic call that's uh, different on <coughs> Christianity or Christians um, that is far more radically relational? Yeah. I mean, empathy is good. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry I'm struggling to answer these questions. I, I mean, I, I had a stroke a few years ago, and one of the challenges I have is just getting the words as quickly as, as, as I need. So if, if this all sounds incoherent, it is incoherent. So just, uh, you know, just pick up some things that you can work with. But in the larger paper that I wrote, of which this is about one third of the length, and so you know, there's lots of stuff I left out, I come back at the end of the, of the article to asking what does this mean for the corrections system or the criminal justice system? And again, this is a bit stumbling, but I do believe that the work of Christ happened at a, at a kind of universal level. Something shifted at a metaphysical level that enabled human healing to take place, whether or not people are aware of it. And so there are one uh, writer uses the notion of traces of grace available in the world. Uh, anonymous traces of grace. So I do believe things like empathy training, restorative processing, um, are ways in which God's healing work does occur. Because God's not some kind of miserly therapist who will not do anything for anybody until they've sort of paid the bill and recognise the, um, the, the source of what the, the help they're getting. God's constantly at work trying to bring the healing work of Christ to bear at every, in every way that God can. I'm, I'm sure about that. So counselling and, and therapy and um, you know, empathy training and parent skills training, so much of the stuff goes back to, to, to parenting. All that's good. I'm, I don't deny that for one moment. So the question becomes, well, what difference does it make to bring the gospel into this? What, 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 does, what do Christians have to add to that? And all I can say at this point is that having a, an understanding of what's happened behind the scenes, what God's about, and being able to personally appropriate it through faith enables you to sort of get more of it, you know, um, to, 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 to appropriate it in a more direct way. The, I remember seeing an image in a video one time about, um, about a kind of revival in a prison in the US, and they have this image. They, they brought in a great big uh, swimming pool to baptize people. And there was an image of a guy coming out of, of the, bapt uh, the baptismal pool with his arms raised up, crying out, in Christ, I'm a new creation. And it was, just, it was very moving to see. And it was like, because of his experience of God, experience of Christ and the, and the gospel, he was able to appropriate that newness in a way that goes beyond what he could get in other ways. Um, so it's, to me, it's not either or. It's not you either do it this way or you do it the secular way. Uh, it's saying God's at work trying to bring healing and, and freedom to the creatures that he's poured out his lifeblood to, to redeem, and every one of them is worthy in God's eyes of redemption. Uh, 
Uh, and the more you know that story and participate, the more you'll get, you know, the, the greater the, the impact will be. <clears throat> so obviously training's good. You know, so I have, I'm not critical of that at all. Hi, Chris, thank you. It was an awesome presentation and, um, yeah. When I think of guilt and Christ's work and uh, Christ restores us to innocence, a sort of state of innocence maybe, maybe this is simplistic, shame Christ restores us to honour. Do you have any thoughts around honour in particular? Um, yeah, reflections on this? I think, uh, you know, going back to the parable of the prodigal son, which I have written a very, very long book on, um, the, the transformation that occurs in the experience of the prodigal son comes from the bestowal of honour by the father on him. Uh, the running out, the, 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 the embracing, the, 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 the robes, the, the ring, the plaited calf and so on, that he was, he was lifting shame through the gift of honour. And again, I think when we look at our sort of social scripts that are available, we don't do that very well. We're very good at conferring shame. The whole criminal justice system is about conferring shame. We, then when a person is finished in prison, they, they are released and then, well, they're supposed to go back to life and be a better person. We have no mechanisms available, at least within Pākehā society, for bestowing honour again. And so I think, I think when it comes to the honour-shame kind of um, paradigm, I, mean, I think if what I say about what's going on, saying the Sermon on the Mount is true, then Jesus is saying you're looking for honour in the wrong place. So your honour comes from how the Father sees you, how your Heavenly Father sees you in secret. And that's the quest. That's what confers honour. The honour of, of genuinely being a, a, an invaluable creature comes from that. Don't seek honour by the kind of public mechanisms that we use in terms of you know, dominance and so on. So I think being able to confer honour, being able to confer a sense of respect, um, that's not dependent on the person's achievements, but is dependent on the person's value as, as, you know, as a, a unique human being, um, is really important in terms of dealing with the, with the legacy of shame and... <sighs> right. <laughs> I think I'm saying the same thing every time, so... Uh, hi, Chris. Thoroughly enjoyed um, your sharing. Um, I'm trying to reframe my question because some of the other earlier ones had touched on it. I am working um, as part of the Royal Commission of Abuse. Uh, uh, in the, in the faith-based uh, right. organisations, churches. Um, you talked earlier around childhood, childhood trauma and what I'm seeing now is uh, people in, well into their 50s, 60s, older, describing themselves right. still um, as being abandoned, rejected, dirty, worthless. And so I wonder, because they were placed many of them in, in church-based programs or initiatives, what message you might have to the church to confront these yeah. issues of yeah. shame? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's, um, that gets to the heart of it, really, doesn't it? I, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, and the burden that people bear because of the things that have done to them as children um, is heart-wrenching to, to realise and recognise. Um, and, and how is that sense of worthlessness and so on to be lifted? Um, again, I think it's part of what you're asking is that how, how is that, how is that what was dealt with by the somehow conferring a sense of honour on that person, the sense that their experience matters what happened to them does matter, that they didn't deserve it. That, you know, that, and I think that kind of acknowledgement, that kind of recognition of their dignity uh, does help to lift some of this legacy of shame. In terms of what it says for the church, I mean, this, you know, this again is, is, is heartbreaking because such a profound betrayal like, has, a, has occurred and 
it's embarrassing to call yourself a Christian today. I mean, it really is, especially in the public arena, it's just really, really difficult to identify because there's such a sense that, that Christian institutions have been no better than others and sometimes worse than others, despite what we say. And, um, and I guess the word to the church is just one of humility, um, shame, <laughs> healthy shame, um, and somehow trying to communicate that you know, this is not this is not the God that you think. I mean, this is this is not the way that, that God views to to the victims. That, I mean, this is the way that, not the way God views them. So, yeah, and there's I mean, there's a as you all know, there's a direct correlation between abandonment as children uh, and and imprisonment. I mean, a, we talk about the prison to school pipeline, school to prison pipeline, but there's an even bigger pipeline, which is from childhood abandonment, childhood abuse, to prison. Um, and that, that must move, we've got to start with compassion with people, whatever they have done. I mean, it's uh, because so often they're damaged goods from, from before they had any power of their own lives. Which, which again, you know, I think where a guilt-based sort of paradigm starts to break down because if you simply approach it in terms of their moral responsibility for their actions and not look at the kinds of... Um, seedbed out of which those wrong actions have emerged, then you know, you're not going to get to that, that point. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, um, we'll finish your questions now. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Answered very well, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, should we give Chris another big hand? Thank you. Uh, so we... Now, everyone is invited, who is physically here, of course, uh, into the atrium for a cup of tea. And there are some brownies. And all of the brownies are... All of the brownies are gluten-free. Okay? A uh, real big thank you to those who have joined us online, um, as well as everyone who's here now, and especially, of course, to Chris. And I think... Um, so the things we've been talking about... Uh, we should um, close our time in prayer. So let's pray together, shall we? Gracious God, we thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for Chris and the wealth of experience and um, insight, scholarship, and indeed empathy and love that he brings uh, to this discussion. And uh, we, we just think about how what has been shared tonight interfaces so much with the broken world that we do live in. So we pray for Chris and his, um, his work with the uh, Restorative Justice uh, Chair in uh, Victoria University. We pray for those who are here with us who are working in the um, corrections and justice and the Royal Commission. And in all of us, as we, um, as we are faced and interact with this issue of shame in our lives and the lives of others. And we pray for your grace, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>